All right. Well, welcome in. Hey, Jeff. Good to see you. Howdy. Good to be here. <laughs> uh, we're excited to have another conversation on Facebook Live, and this one's going to be um, tailored around work or vocation or what it looks like for the follower of Jesus to participate in ordinary work and how that reflects the image of God. But I wanted to give Jeff just a second just to introduce himself. He's a good friend of mine, and uh, we've been journeying together for a couple years now, but thankful for your friendship. You want to give us the introduction soundbite? Sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Shu, and I am the executive oh, director of Flourish okay, San Diego. Video. Let's try that again. Uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, working out the bugs, peeps. It's just that time. It's just that season. Hey. For some reason, I have you muted. <laughs> Let me try that again. Um, here we go. Okay. How about that? Now I can hear you. That's great. And uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Jeff Shu. Uh, I am the executive director of Flourish San Diego, and I am accustomed, unaccustomed to being hung up on on Skype calls. <laughs> oh, man. What do you do at Flourish? Well, so we like to say our name is our aim. So we're very interested in seeing uh, San Diego flourish. And uh, we believe that that is a great way of capturing what the body of Christ is supposed to be up to. And so we help churches navigate the great changes in culture so they can form the kinds of people that love their neighbors to life. That's awesome. Yeah, I went through um, Flourish's Academy a couple years ago, and that's where I met Jeff and um, learned a lot about kind of the, some of the theologies that we're going to be talking about um, this morning. We're still morning. We're afternoon, this afternoon or whenever you're watching. Um, so, Jeff, let's jump in it. Let's talk about work. Let's talk about vocation and why that's important for humanity. But I figured the best place to start would be at the beginning uh, in Genesis. Um, I don't know. I think that it's always a normal thing to start with. But as we talk about work, as we talk about maybe even a, a bigger theological idea of the meaning or value of humanity, um, can you start in Genesis? What is the purpose of uh, us as created beings in the narrative of Scripture? Yeah, and feel free to jump in if you want me to clarify something. Um, but yeah, Genesis is a great place to start because... Um, it really does set the context for how we're supposed to understand who we are in the context of God's broader story. Right. So at the beginning of it, in Genesis, uh, we're told that God created the world. And in chapter two, he, uh, the pinnacle of his creation uh, story, places his image bearers inside this new creation. Yeah. Um, and we're told that we're made in his image. And so that tells us a couple of things. You know, God... If there's anything we've learned in the first six days is that he's creative, he created the world, he made something. And uh, it's almost as if the, the narrative is saying, um, and now let's stick my image mm -hmm. inside this creation and see what they make of it. In fact, they're even told to um, rule over and uh, steward the creation. Uh, to discover how it works and, and uh, invent and create and discover, um, you know, all the neat ways in which um, God's blessing has been latent uh, within the world. Um, so all that to say that we're created in the image of a worker. Yeah. And um, we then must have a fresh look at how our work, um, our vocation, indeed our calling, actually is more critical to our understanding of who we are and what life is about than we actually may know. Right. That's great. Um, and I think it's important in that, especially in the Genesis narrative, to realize that there's, there's a difference between maybe what we'd understand as a primary calling and a secondary calling. And so that primary calling is... Um, found in Adam and Eve's presence with God. They were intimately in relationship with him and there was worship, there was connectivity. Um, and that was the primary calling. And it's still the same for us. Our primary calling as followers of Jesus, as created beings in this world that God had designed is to worship and be in relationship with God. But what I love though, is that there's stuff to do. <laughs> it's not just, um, 
it's not just a singular calling, but there's a secondary vocation. And we see that in Adam and Eve's um, uh, creative initiative that God says to work and to care for the garden. Jeff, do you do any gardening? I did some ruling and <laughs> subduing of my backyard the other day. If you you did? call that gardening. Okay. There you go. Right. But gardening is hard work. And what's interesting is that work came before the fall. Right. And, and I'm um, that type of work or that type of labor partnering with God and his creation came before sin. And then um, so we see those primary callings and those secondary callings as the primary one that every human being um, has. It's the same for everyone is to worship God um, and enjoy him. Um, but that secondary calling is is played out in our own work, whether ordinary, normal, wherever we find ourselves. Um, but that secondary calling gives us the ability to reflect God as creator and to cultivate the world around us. So I appreciate as we begin in Genesis, um, identifying that. Um, how would you describe what work is for anyone listening? Um, and why is this work uh, essential to us as human beings? Yeah, so uh, a great little phrase, I'm not quite sure who to attribute it to, um, once said that work is the form that love takes, mm. right? So when we're asked to love our neighbors in the scriptures, the way in which we get to love our neighbors is through our actions, through the things that we do that provide value uh, or perhaps meet a need uh, of a neighbor. And so work is the form, it's a shape that love takes, is a great way to think about our entire lives being called our work, you know, not just something we get paid for. Right. right? So, um, so when I'm, when I'm now in the midst of the pandemic, we've got a lot of people quarantined at home and, and a lot of parents are finding themselves as homeschoolers, right? Yeah. Well, you know, this isn't what I'd signed up for, but yes, this is, this is hard work. Uh, and what you're doing is providing value to your kids because they're learning how to read and to study and they're learning math, uh, these sorts of things. So, so much of what we do in life can be called work because it's something that's done that offer where we create value in service of others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think probably some major misconceptions that I grew up with specifically um, was maybe characterized in the line like it's really the pastor's work that's sacred and everyone else's work is just kind of normal and necessary for a paycheck. If you were to bring some helpful reframing to our understanding of work, that sacred things that we think are really important and those secular things that we don't think are important, how would you uh, really describe maybe a holistic approach to that understanding? Yeah, so what we normally um, want to draw attention to is that so much of the way in which we um, view the world today gets carved up in, into two categories that I'm particularly interested relative to this question. One is there are things in this world which are sacred, and there are things in this world which are secular. Uh, there are some things in this world that fall in the category of matter to God, and other things that are uh, God's like meh. Uh, about right. now what that does is it tends to say oh there are only some things um, that if I really love God I would do and then but the problem with that is that leaves the bulk of the people who are not in professional ministry or a missionary or something uh, as having to sort of settle for a secondary class of uh, citizenship in the kingdom uh, that that is never really convinced that they can be used of the Lord. And so not only is there a separation between sacred vocations and secular, holy and profane, um, there is a, an escalation of value for mm -hmm. that which is sacred. Right. Uh, and which unintentionally devalues most of us, you know, that don't have uh, sacred professions. I feel like I should pause there for a moment. This, was there a clarifying or a second part of that question? No, I think that's great. I mean, I think starting to peel back the layers of that understanding um, brings a lot of meaning and value back to 
um, work that people are engaging in Monday through Friday every week. So if we look at the amount of time that people are spending at their job, it's tremendous. I mean, it's it's something that um, we're spending most of our lives um, working in. Um, nine to five, 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday, some people even much more than that. Um, and so what's interesting is uh, when we look at our own professions, and I know this is coming from a pastor, so it's ironic because I have that sacred, uh, sacred job. But um, as we look towards the work of everyone else in the world, we have to understand that there is great value to that work, um, especially as we look back to Genesis and see that God gave humans the ability to partner in cultivating the world around us. And so we have that primary calling is to worship God, to honor him, be in relationship with him. But everyone else has secondary callings where we get to exhibit that type of creativity, um, reflect the nature of God in his creation through our everyday work, whether that's staying at home, whether that's being an accountant or a a barista at Starbucks. Um, But I do think it's important, maybe you can pull this out a little bit, because I think we have a hard time of framing our own work um, in the regular, ordinary world um, as something that has the possibility or capacity to reflect God's creative work in the world. So if I was an accountant and I came to you and said, Jeff, I don't understand how crunching numbers or doing spreadsheets could ever reflect the work of God in the world, what would you say to that person? How does an accountant have the capacity to reflect God's image in their secondary vocation? Yeah, I tell you, you know, there are folks in this world that absolutely think in Excel spreadsheet blocks. It's like like amazing to me. And when I first started this role and started this nonprofit, it's like I had no idea that there are even different kinds of accounting for nonprofits. Uh, And so um, I'll tell you that one of our volunteers, one of the gals that handles, you know, our um, books is, you know, she's got a background in that. uh, And I uh, in accounting, and she's been a, uh, an entrepreneur. And so what's been really cool is that she just absolutely delights that her her knowledge of accounting, uh, her desire to balance the books to the penny, um, and to be able to pull up meaningful reports quickly through our um, accounting software, yeah. that here she knows that she is doing something that she has been gifted with, and offering it to help our ministry run and, quite frankly, to keep me from pulling my hair out. Uh, (laughs) She can do something far more effectively and far more quickly and far more accurately and far more legally than I would be able to uh, because of the way in which she's wired. And so, again, if we say that work is the form that love takes, what she's doing is she's offering all of her skills and abilities and creating something of value for me so that I can do what I do, creating value for hopefully the city of San Diego. If we think through the secular lens, it's just someone volunteering because they know books. But if we think through the sacred lens, it's someone who is stewarding God's gifts of grace upon her, finding someone in need and performing the work that actually demonstrates love. Yeah. Um, and so that's how an accountant would do it. Um, I think it's actually fascinating to, to see this played out in the midst of this pandemic where everyone's quarantined. Right. Uh, if I can uh, yeah, play it out. Do. It's like when I sit down before a meal and I say grace and I say thanks, thank you, Lord, for providing this meal for me. Absolutely, God gave that meal to me. But when you start thinking about it, it was the hands that prepared it, right? It was, you know, if I have a slice of bread, um, there was a baker that baked that, right? (laughs) And made it available in a grocery store where there are still grocery store workers, you know, today with their masks on. And that somehow that loaf of bread got there through people who are trucking stuff still Mm -hmm. in the midst of a pandemic. Um, And there are still bakers and commercial warehouses that are baking these things and people milling flour. And there are still farmers that have um, grown the grain. And so the reality is, in order for me to get my slice of bread at dinner, God absolutely did provide it. 
but he provided it through the giftings and callings, the vocation and the work of many, many different people, yeah. all of whom today are called essential. But I would argue every single job that we have is essential and more sacred than we know. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me of um, Brother Lawrence in Practicing the Presence of God. Um, when he says, I'm going to butcher, I'll paraphrase, but he says, like, we need to recognize that God is present with us intimately. Um, and that in every moment we're addressing God's presence, whether dishwashing or in community prayer. And the actions we take, um, the work we do has significant value um, to the world around us. And in one understanding that it affects all kinds of people, um, even though we might not see the big connections, but also that this work is um, being done in the presence of the creator at all times. Um, but I love that. I, th I love how you drew the dots back towards those people and how their work is significantly affecting our lives right now in a positive way um, that the pandemic allows us the eyes to see. Because uh, I don't think we normally think about the baker or the truck driver. But right now, when we don't have access to the things we want or need, those people are extremely valuable um, to us. So I love that. That's great. What about if we're to maybe switch gears a little bit? Um, what about for people who hate their job? <laughs> Is there any encouragement or wisdom you might give them? Um, as we view all of work through this sacred lens um, and, in, and see work as an invitation to participate in what God is doing. What would you say to those people yeah. who hate their work? Yeah, you know, that, a lot of, I'd say a lot of things. Uh, hopefully they would be <laughs> uh, a blessing. A um, couple thoughts. You know, we often tend to think of work as the evil thing that we have to do or the, the difficult thing that we have to do in order to be able to make a living. Right. Uh, and as you had said earlier, you know, work was given before the fall. Uh, and the fall actually just made the work difficult. Um, so there's something far more intrinsically good about work than we typically know how to give credit for. Now, if we are able to understand that, then we can kind of look at uh, um, pain and difficulty, uh, being underemployed, being unemployed, you know, right now, um, as, um, yes, certainly challenges, uh, but a couple thoughts. One, that God uses work uh, almost, I would say, as a significant, if not primary place in which um, he does his formation work in our hearts. Yeah. Um, you know, when things are difficult um, because they're not the way I want it or because I think I can do a better job than my boss or fill in the blank, um, it's actually a wonderful chance to stop up and ask, all right, Lord, what am I learning about myself uh, in the midst of this? Uh, how might I see the pain and the challenges in front of me as actually, not to sound weird, but as a gift of the Lord mm -hmm. to kind of give us indicators about our own character that we need to either have greater patience with or learn how to love a coworker. Um, so it, it, it's when there's difficulty and when work is just not a fun place I want to be, then first thing you want to do is you want to stop and ask a question. All right. Um, in what way is it difficult because I'm just selfish or tired or, or hangry? Um, and how do I cooperate with um, God in understanding what is it about me that uh, can change? But the other thing is that it may also be uh, a reminder to say, hey, look, you know, maybe this, this isn't the best place uh, for you to be able to steward all of your giftings. Um, and that uh, maybe getting laid off is, is one of the ways to be able to consider um, um, an opportunity. You know, uh, maybe the Lord's uh, saying there are some other places where you might be able to use your gifts uh, that are not um, um, that can have greater redemptive uh, influence in the world. I don't know. Uh, hard to say, but that's a possibility. And I think the third thing I say is in the absence of an opportunity to move on, uh, in the absence of really opportunities, um, I think the challenge always becomes how do, if work doesn't feel meaningful, how do we bring meaning to the work? Um, and I think a theology of work really helps us with that, right? Yeah. Like, oh, uh, you know, I got to be here and I gotta, I've got to, um, 
um, I've got to check groceries, you know, or I'm touching things and, you know, I got customers that are coughing at me and, um, as opposed to saying, no, um, you know, people aren't going to be able to get their groceries, be able to feed their families, um, unless someone like me is standing here, uh, as best I know how offering value, checking out, creating the transactions for the people who need these groceries. Yeah. Right. Um, and that I can do so in a way that might uh, reflect Jesus a little bit more, that I might be a calming presence, uh, even in the midst of my uncertainty of my own health and well-being. Um, that's a way of bringing meaning uh, to one's work that hopefully helps with the pain and difficulty of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I guess I would end uh, with maybe a word of encouragement, and you're welcome to join me uh, if anything comes to your head when you think of it. Um, but in this moment of the COVID-19 virus, I, I think a lot of people have been either displaced and so they're not working at all, or they're in jobs experiencing a lot of fear of maybe tracking home a virus back home or um, infecting someone else if they are asymptomatic and don't know what that they are themselves affected. Um, and I would say just a couple of things. One, um, I want to pray for you if you've lost a job and that this moment is definitely difficult for many people. And um, I pray and hope that a church or um, God's people in general can support you. Um, but we want to encourage you in this moment not to give up hope. Um, to use this time as a place for reflection and really looking at the value of work and maybe how you might be able to impact the world and participate in God's creation once this COVID-19 passes. Um, the other thing is for those of you who are fearful, um, we pray that you see hope in this situation. We pray that you find great meaning and value in the work that you're doing right now as you're providing and caring for um, people all around you. I can remember uh, talking to some nurses from our community um, who were really afraid of going to the hospital and bringing the virus back home to their families um, and how beautiful their work is and selfishly giving away their time, their safety to serve and care for other people. And so we are so thankful for you if you're still working um, in this moment and hope um, that you find peace and rest in the Lord. Um, but thank you, Jeff, so much for joining me on, on this quick conversation. Sure. Um, it's great to have your input, especially looking at and viewing um, the world of work around us because we're all working at some level. Um, and work is a beautiful way to partner with God and his creation. So thank you so much for joining me and having this conversation. You're welcome. Glad to be here.